Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Crypto Gremlins. My name is Roy Blackstone, and we are here. Yes, we've done a rebrand pump. This is a new episode. It's called Your Next Gem. We're no longer the Phil Before Shield podcast. It's not really a podcast anyway. It's more of an interview thing. So yeah, I'm here today. We're talking to Dusk Network. This is the second project I'm talking to and doing an interview with. It's a very interesting project that I've been pretty bullish on in the past about a year or so since I've known uh, Emanuele. And I am joined here by Emanuele, uh, Emanuele Franchoni, who is a great, great guy. I, we, uh, we have, as well, two other people who are not here. We have Ross from Ethfinex and uh, my assistant, Greedy Ferengi Mark. They will be here in the second half of this video, so I'm going to splice them together. But for now, this is just kind of a one-on-one -on -one between me and Emanuela. So, Emanuela, just go ahead and introduce yourself to the world. Say hi to YouTube. Hi. Well, this was actually kind of long overdue to be to be completely honest. I've been uh, I've been meaning to get in touch with you and have a, and have a one on one for quite some time. How long has it been? A couple of months? Oh, it's been like a that? while. It's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. So, um, yeah. Hello, <laughs> I am uh, Manuele Francioni, and I am the tech lead and the project lead at uh, Dusk Network, and uh, um, so yeah, I'm very excited to. Uh, to, to be here and yeah. uh, I'm ready to answer any kind of question you might have. Awesome. So yeah, so uh, a lot of people who are watching this video first, obviously they're asking, they're curious, what the hell is Dusk Network? So I wanted to give kind of a basic gestalt on Dusk Network and what it is and what it stands for and really what it kind of aims to do. So I generally, I would say in the crypto ecosystem and the crypto space, we have this this push towards infrastructure projects, Ethereum killers, and all these kind of things. And Dusk, to me, stands out a little bit to the side of that on its own island because it tries to do, it is, yes, at the end of the day, it is called Dusk Network. Yes, it's a network, it's its own infrastructure, but it is not trying to achieve the same things that everyone else is achieving. So Dusk Network is an infrastructure built entirely uh, for privacy, as well as STO issuance and private communications. And I think I, that is one of the things that I'm pretty bullish on. Most crypto traders that I talk to, uh, so CryptoPath, for example, everyone knows him. Uh, other individuals are really, really bullish on things like Zcash, uh, Monero as well. Ricardo Spagna obviously is a very famous individual in the crypto uh, ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the reason is because privacy is one of those things that initially brought people to Bitcoin itself and there it was before it kind of we had all of the chain analysis companies and everyone else figuring out who's whose addresses were whose privacy was a really big feature and it still kind of is for bitcoin but it's been moved it's been moving towards other chains like zcash like monero and i think possibly like dusk in the future so yeah if you wanted to give or a little bit present. more on dusk yeah in the present they just they just launched <laughs> we're we're in testnet right now right yeah absolutely yeah. so they absolutely. just launched testnet a few days ago so you guys are reading we are the first channel to break the story so i'm super excited about it so yeah if anything else you wanted to talk about <laughs> just give people a general overview of dusk network and uh yeah we can go from there i i, I think you said it you said it quite well i mean uh, uh generally i'm i'm well known to be to be sometimes whenever i'm talking about dusk to be kind of a madman rambler uh, so i will i will actually steal uh what somebody else told about Dusk, who is our lead cryptographer, uh, Dimitri Kovratovic. And uh, paraphrasing him, he said that Dusk to him looks like, um, you know, a, a blockchain, uh, a, a distributed proposition that has got the same privacy level of Zcash and the same flexibility and opportunity um, of Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think it kind of it kind of makes sense what 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 he says, considering that we aim to be, um, you know, one of the main um, ledger for uh, uh, privacy, and at the same time, we are also developing our uh, zero knowledge virtual machine that will give us zero knowledge smart contracts, um, pretty much like uh, Ethereum. And uh, I think that this is. You know the, the most coincise way mm -hmm. if you want yeah. that i can that i can uh, go to describe yeah. i mean it, describe it's, it's it's certainly an interesting before i get into my question certainly i think it's an interesting approach because a lot of what of these other chains and protocols will do is they say well we're just ethereum but we're faster so they approach it from mm -hmm. a scalability perspective or they'll approach it from 
well, you can build uh, EVM compatible apps and they're a little bit faster. So, you know, maybe like 10 times faster on our chain. And so that's why we're better. Or we or our chain has more industry connections or our chain has a different kind of consensus agreement or proof of stake or or sharding in mm -hmm. some cases. So so there, there's all, usually all of these different kind of tech propositions. And certainly that's not to say that Dusk isn't technically a powerhouse because it really is. You've shown me some of the stuff. <laughs> I don't know if I can disclose it. But some of the stuff you've shown me for Dusk is really, really like cutting edge stuff, man. Uh, and it's really great <laughs> yeah. to see that, that it's implemented onto a chain. Um, but Dusk is approaching it less from a from a sense of we need to scale things and we need to beat things from a, let's say, a tech perspective and more of let's see what we can approach it from a privacy perspective. And how, how can we leverage that and give privacy to individuals and smart contract users, so on and so forth. So I, I think that's something that's really interesting about uh, Dusk. Yeah. No, definitely. It's um, the interesting. The interesting point um, is the fact that privacy, uh, and especially the breed of privacy um, that we are, or the breed of cryptography that we are that we are um, employing, that we are actively researching and we are rolling out, is interestingly is not only a solution for privacy, but it is also a solution for uh, speed, for performance, for scalability and gives also access to a plethora of different business cases that are very ill served by uh, you know by a non private uh, proposition as a matter of fact so uh, probably would help if i would tell you why we we did dusk what what was it that basically triggered us to create uh, a completely new chain that uses a completely different consensus algorithm that didn't even exist before, which is called segregated Byzantine agreement or Byzantine, depending on the flavor of English that you speak. Um, and, uh, and how we are applying, uh, you know, all the cryptographic novelties that we are developing right now. So the main reason why we are, um, you know, researching and developing actively in the cryptographic space and especially in the zero knowledge uh, cryptography is because it has the potential to uh, let anyone uh, in a trustless way verify that certain particular statement, uh, a polynomial statement, but whatever, a statement is true or not. Um, to give you an example, if I am if I am processing something right uh, in, in a decentralized environment, how can you trust that the process that I did that my processing is correct? And I am not simply, you know, just uh, sending rubbish to mm -hmm. people right. as an outcome. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the only thing that you can do if you're not really, uh, you know, using zero knowledge cryptography, the only thing that you can do is actually to do the processing yourself and compare the outcome, right? So in this way, um, basically, this means that th this is one of the one of the problem with the scalability of smart contract, for example, because whenever I am having a, a decentralized processing of a certain program that is uploaded on a distributed virtual machine, then all the nodes inside of the network, they all need to process the same or to redo the same processing again, given the inputs or the transaction right. of this processing in order to see if the, um, you know, if the, the computation makes sense. Mm -hmm. With zero knowledge cryptography, you can have one entity that does the process, the processing, that propagates the outcome of this processing together with the proof of correctness, the zero knowledge proof of correctness. And everybody in the network can just verify the proof and trust, actually not even trust, and compute that the outcome of this processing is correct without even knowing the input. It's a little bit like uh, like black magic or sounded like black yeah. Magic I mean, this me. is this, this is kind of like you've kind of in a way solved the p equals mp problem a little yeah, bit. Right? Well, I, I wouldn't say you really solved it, but you, you you've kind of you've kind of circumvented it a little bit. 
Yeah, if, if you will, but uh, not really. I mean, the, the verification of the zero knowledge proof, of course, uh, is, 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 is not for free. You know, it's right, burdensome right. somehow. Of course. Uh, but is uh, depending on what kind of processing or what kind of smart contract, if, I, if we transit a little bit to more blockchain friendly terms, uh, depending on what kind of smart contracts you, you are running, then uh, the verification is normally order of mag magnitudes faster than reprocessing the, mm. the, the whole thing. Um, and this alone provides, um, you know, very incredible opportunities for for performances, which is also the reason why Ethereum is uh, making concrete steps toward, uh, you know, just uh, adopting uh, ZK snarks more and more, right. their own breed of uh, zero knowledge cryptography. Um, we simply had it from, or we simply planned for it from the ground up. And uh, we also embedded zero knowledge cryptography inside of our consensus algorithm, which is, like I said, segregated by Xantin agreement, uh, which uses uh, a methodology which we call the blind bead methodology that, in fact, is the first uh, private and most performant privacy uh, proof of stake protocol out there. And uh, so it's not only about privacy, it's also about performances. And yeah. It is also about a lot of different things. Now, the interesting part about zero knowledge cryptography is the fact that if you can prove um, a statement, you can prove, for example, without uh, disclosing the input parameters or without disclosing or leaking someone's identity, you can prove that you are abiding by a set of rules that are encoded in a smart contract, but without really revealing who you are yeah, exactly. and without revealing the transactions that you're making. So this is the principle of the zero knowledge smart contract. And as you can imagine, this has groundbreaking applica applications in the regulated industry, where, for example, uh, you need to abide by uh, sometimes uh, even complex set of rules in order to prove that you have uh, the ability that you have been, um, you know, allowed to uh, perform certain kind of transactions, whatever these transactions are. And this, of course, has um, the potential to finally bring the uh, market of decentralized securities or digital securities, digital shares mm -hmm. to life, Yeah, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, yeah, I, I think you, you kind of you touched on a few things there. And one of the things that I wanted to, to look at, at, at least from a pure comparing blockchain perspective, I, the, the question I had to ask, and we're going a little bit forward here, but that's fine. I, I was going to ask you, and I think I have a little bit of the answer piece together already. Is The, the question was, so we, we've seen a few of these uh, privacy-based chains already. So we've seen projects, main, mainframe exam, is a good example of, the, of one of them. Monero is another good example, obviously. Zcash. And the question is, uh, how, do you, how do you hope to kind of succeed where these chains in a sense failed because if we look at zcash for example the problem with zcash is 99 percent of zcash transactions are not anonymous because you have to turn on the anonymity it's not on by default and so the entire chain is rendered completely useless because every only the transactions that you want to hide are the ones hidden and so it's, it's kind of very obvious right uh, and you kind of stick out like a sore thumb if you're trying to send an anonymous transaction Monero, on the other hand, has anonymity for every single transaction. But the problem with Monero is it's very slow and it's, it's not very scalable and it's very CPU intensive. So I, I, I will answer part of that for you <laughs> because I, I see now <laughs> it, the, the thing about Dusk, which is interesting, is it does have I, I was looking recently at all of the, the tech uh, propositions or the tech proposition of it. And you've built anonymity into practically every single place you could possibly squeeze it in. So you've put it in terms of, it's, it's hard to verify it. Well, it's not hard. It's, it's basically impossible to verify uh, or to know exactly who was sending something. So anonymity is there. You have privacy in terms of transactions. You, you have a range. Okay, this guy sent some, uh, some number between zero and X amount of dusk. And I know that that is true, but I don't know exactly how much dusk. And so even, even the consensus agreement has anonymity and privacy built in which I think is, is where Zcash kind of 
didn't do so well. And then the other side of that is Monero did it well, but it's very it's not very scalable. So it looks like Dusk Network is certainly more scalable. So so is that kind of where you look? Do you look at Monero and Zcash kind of as competitors at all in this sense, or have you really just completely outshined them? Are they just old blockchains now? Or are you just a second generation privacy blockchain? Or what do you think? Well, what I think is that um, first of all, we a lot of the uh, of the different researches that we are that we are doing or the things that we are rolling out right now, they have been um, they more or less have been highly either as have been highly inspired by the work of Zcash mm -hmm. primarily right uh, and uh, in some cases we even collaborated with uh, uh, with people from their from their team I mean not uh, not an official collaboration but we definitely uh, reached out for uh, um, you know for uh, suggestions and advices and uh, the the interesting thing about the world of cryptography and technology and open source in general is the fact that there isn't really much competition. I mean, competition is probably uh, more on the business side. Mm -hmm. For us, it's much more important to actually collaborate into, um, you know, refining all the tools that are available. And it's incredibly important for us also to release our material uh, with MIT license so that anybody can, can use it. Uh, to give you an example, we are we uh, are reusing uh, the bulletproof or we forked the part of the bulletproof library of dalek which is incredibly well made it is uh, it is uh, developed in rust we have our own we adapted it we evolved it and now we have the zero calf uh, library and um, and the zero calf li with the zero calf library we are hoping to give back to the community. Uh, our f The first uh, hashing algorithm that we have been using in the blind bid is called MIMC Longsight, which is um, uh, an evolution made for bulletproof of uh, a similar hashing algorithm that Zcash is using. So from a, uh, from a technological perspective, then there isn't that much competition as much as basically collaboration among right. uh, a, a lot of different projects. For um, for what concern the um, how Dusk sets itself apart from a business perspective is the fact that uh, all these different chains, especially privacy chains, and I will get to Monero in a, in a second, but all these different uh, uh, anonymity chains, they uh, sort of built anonymity for the sake of it. It's not that they had um, any other any other intent mm -hmm. than just grant uh, anonymous transactions. Right. This uh, makes them probably uh, fitting the niche of store of value, sort of a sort of a business. Uh, whereas our uh, our goal, our declared goal, was the capability of uh, bringing uh, you know transactions and uh, and fitting the regulatory um, framework for privacy for regulated assets. So this gave us uh, a different focus, a different kind of goal. We are not really aiming to use Dusk solely as a store of value, but primarily what we wanted to do was to unlock the uh, capability to offer uh, a permissionless ledger to the regulated industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, probably you have seen around propositions uh, based sometimes on Ethereum, based on Stellar, based on uh, a lot of different other chains that are trying to enter the security space. Uh, but unfortunately, what they what they offer is not very well suited, you know, to all the different regulatory frameworks that are out there. Most of which are based on either on privacy or a restriction among different transactors or uh, um, other kind of uh, other kind of regulations mm -hmm. so um, even even if they would fit the, the the regulatory aspect who is going to trade securities on an open ledger <laughs> i mean can you can you really can you really think uh, or can you really imagine Vanguard or BlackRock that is uh, taking a position on a certain particular asset and um, <laughs> you know just uh, publicly uh, publish a transaction yeah, on, no, that, on yeah, an that's, open ledger. That's, that's not going to fly. 
<laughs> that's, that's not only it's not going to fly, it's going to be completely counterproductive. I mean, right. people are going to see the strategies mm. um, of investment. It's going to be it's going to be hell from a price manipulation perspective. Exactly. Uh, it's uh, it's not only a regulatory nightmare. It's also um, you know also works against uh, all the strategies of these businesses. Um, so, you know, so the capability of doing something in a privacy oriented way and yet assure, reassure regulators that there is no leak of information, but at the same time that the transactors, so people who transact of a certain particular asset, they are allowed to do so. So that's all there is for us. This is really the problem that we want to solve. And of course, this problem doesn't only have implication in the regulatory industry, but pretty much in everything that has got to do with the business world. Nobody would want to publish or to, um, yeah, to publish on an open ledger uh, the price of its own services. Mm -hmm. So uh, let alone how much you're paying for something, you know, there there is something like a, uh, you know, secrecy of um, of, uh, of trade. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Yeah. So, um, I mean, Monero you know, if I if I was Zcash, <laughs> if I was BlackRock, I wouldn't want someone knowing that I just bought ten million dollars worth of Tesla stocks or puts or options, so on and so forth. They just yeah, it, it wouldn't yeah, make yeah, sense. Of course, ah, in, indeed. But what about what about a billion? <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> the, uh, because let's not forget that when we are talking about regulated regulated assets, we are talking about a trillion or more than a trillion dollar mm -hmm. worth of market. Right. Um, these guys don't don't screw around. Yeah, you know? I, I mean, a good example <laughs> of that is when I think it was J.P. Morgan last year or a year and a half ago, they were buying a, a bunch of silver. And it was known that they were buying a bunch of silver. And this actually caused a little bit of a f feedback loop where the price of silver started going up. So definitely yeah. there you can see it if, if you know, this is, is you absolutely need an anonymity and privacy when it comes to these kind of things. They're very delicate. Um, so you, yeah, you kind absolutely. of you kind of talked a little bit about this um, when people, especially in crypto. So this is more of a crypto related question. When people mm -hmm. in crypto talk about the term STO and STO offering, STO industry, the projects that come to mind are Polymath. They are Securitize. There are things mm -hmm. like uh, Harbor. How so? These these are entrants that are a little bit more well known in the STO space. And Dusk is looking to attack this 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 STO. I wouldn't say problem, but this STO industry. How do you think Dusk measures up to them? What does Dusk do that's different? What makes Dusk better? Can you elucidate? Uh, yeah, of course. So um, one thing about all the proposition that you're that you're talking about is the fact that they are applications. Mm -hmm. They are applications on top of a different uh, of a different technology that they do not control. Um, I believe most of them they are based on the Ethereum chain, uh, Polymath, for example, and uh, they. Uh, the only way that they can enforce, um, you know, restrictions among different uh, different tran transactors or even privacy, uh, considering that it is not built in in the uh, in the protocol, although there are standards that are trying to you know address that particular that particular use case, they need to work around uh, uh, the limitations of the base layer, uh, and the only way that they have, considering that. You know they can't really go and change the the underlying protocol is to take a lot of their um, a lot of their operations off chain, and this is a huge problem for two different reasons. First of all, because they uh, act this way, they act uh, at the same level of a, of, a, of the usual middleman, um, and uh, this is so uh, you know the, this is so painful that uh, indeed Polymath started already to migrate to their own chain. Right. Uh, so it's uh, <laughs> this is one of the one of the, the issues. The second problem with this with all these applications is the fact that they are applications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they are no network. This means that they have uh, a declared uh, intent for profit that 
you know, is completely uh, disjoint from the value of the underlying token. Right. Uh, in this this way, they need to sell something. They need to make profit for for for, for themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, whereas Dusk uh, Dusk Network is a network. It's open for anyone to use. Anybody can can create a, a, a zero knowledge smart contract, and uh, you know deploy it on uh, on the Dusk chain. It's absolutely it, you do not even need to know that we do exist. You right. just need to basically interface with uh, with. So, the so it's like permissioned versus permissionless. Mainly is the is the advantage uh, in a, here. In a way, right. yes, exactly. In 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 a way, uh, as a matter of fact, um, that's. That's probably the best way. The best way to put it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, let alone all the different, um, you know, technological advancements that we, we have been working on, uh, and we have been working and we have been embedding them directly at the base layer. So we have absolutely no restriction whatsoever in what we can do in order to. Um, you know, just accomplish right. uh, the um, the task that uh, that we set up to to, to solve. Um, not only that, we also we also do um, have a mandate uh, to create an ecosystem that doesn't depend on us, which mm. is the you know the, the most powerful the most powerful tool that we have in order to diversify diversify ourselves. Together with that, um, you know how. How do you how do you devour a whale? Well, one bite at a time, right? So right. Uh, we do not aim to become immediately the solution to the global financial market. We have a keen focus on a regulatory realm right now, which is the European Union, where all the different compliance frameworks are harmonized. Mm -hmm. We are going to take all that first. And after solving that, we are going to um, you know, just expand in all the different other regions. If we are trying to uh, propose a framework that works for the entire world, it's never going to work. Right. Because there is an heterogeneity and, um, uh, you know, some differences, sometimes even antithetic between uh, frame uh, between uh, uh, territory and territory, between legislation and legislation. Right. And trying to come up with something that satisfies everything is borderline impossible. You need to lobby a lot of different, uh, a lot of different regulators. You need to convince them that whatever it is good for, uh, let's say, uh, Singapore is also good for, um, for the European Union. And it's also good for South America, or it's luck. also good for the, for the SEC. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. So we are really not trying to, to be uh, global or to go global from day one, we are going to take a market that we know extremely well while developing uh, the framework and uh, you know the building blocks to cover to cover everything globally, which eventually we are going to we are going to do, but not from the start. There it is, uh, there it is, gentlemen. World domination is on the roadmap. <laughs> our dust network so i had one more question here we're going to wrap up this first half of the interview in the second half we will talk a little bit more about the tech um so zooming out a little bit uh we we've seen now and in, in, i think you did this in about a week you launched your you launched on binance dusk started trading on binance and that kind of came out of the blue i wasn't expecting that and then you started trading in a few days after that you started trading on uh, bitfinex and efinex and I thought to myself, wow, that's that's really crazy that they managed to do this. First, that they managed to do it that quickly. And then secondly, that they managed to to do this kind of thing with almost, I would say, competing exchanges because every exchange is competing, right? Uh, how did you get that together where, with Ethfinex and Binance? How did you get that going? And it's such a short time. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, let's also not forget that uh, Bittrex International uh, listed us uh, the same day when Bitfinex and Itfinex uh, listed us. Yeah, I, I think so, that's that's really that's really rare. To, I don't think I've ever seen a project do that so quickly on different exchanges. So well done. <laughs> Thank P you. Possibly uh, world uh, first. Uh, if so, if, if a viewer knows a project that has done this before, please message me because I think it's it's pretty interesting. 
I've, I've never seen exchanges <laughs> do this before. Um, I would love to, to take credit for that, to be honest, uh, but um, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's we are we are obviously incredibly grateful for for the trust that these uh, that these incredible institutions that these incredible businesses uh, and exchanges uh, gave us. Um, Somehow, we always try to create, um, I would say, a context, an environment of collaboration. This is something that we are that we stress uh, pretty much right off the bat whenever we are talking with a with a partner. Um, we are we are trying we are, we are really trying to make <laughs> the world a better place. I mean, for how mundane that that, that might <laughs> sound, but I'm, I'm an engineer. I mean, every right. every tool that, that that I'm using, uh, all the tools that I'm using, apart from those that that I crafted myself, is based on somebody else's research. So, it's um, and so everything that we are that we are developing is uh, you know it's there and it can be used by anyone. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, talking about Binance DAX, for example, then the very first day that we have, well, before actually being approved with, uh, I, I believe, 11 votes out of 11, something yes, like that. Yes, 11, to, to, correct. To, to, to get on, the, on, on Binance DAX, we also published two uh, BEP, which are the... Um, you know the betterment proposals for for the chain, mm -hmm. uh, because we stumbled upon these different uh, these different novelties. One, I believe, is proof of proof of, uh, of stake, which is particularly useful for uh, um, proof of stake uh, propositions, uh, and especially those that are based on tendermint. And uh, we uh, don't. Re I mean, we stumbled upon it, and uh, we are probably not not going to use it ourselves because of the privacy nature of our own uh, proof of blind bid. Uh, most probably we will try and find a way to create, uh, um, you know, light nodes or uh, to, you know, optimize a little bit our own chain. But definitely it solves uh, or it might actually unlock several different use cases for uh, proof, of, proof of stake um, chain. And therefore, we uh, we filed it as a BEP. And uh, another another thing, uh, after Togrul, one of our senior researcher, um, Togrul found out that uh, it could also improve uh, protection uh, against front running uh, for for uh, for Binance Dex. It's not that they have a problem. That's not that's not it. They don't have a security problem but certainly from a theoretical perspective he came mm. up with a way to uh, to even make it more secure against this kind of tax and therefore he created this other BEP so um and we did that before being being listed and whether we were going to be listed or not then the then these you know uh improvements I, I, well, you know, I already mentioned it. I think it's super rare and really interesting. And uh, I, I would definitely, it, any, again, I'll mention this. If anyone who's watching this has another project that's done something similar, please let me know. Because I, I think it's pretty unprecedented. Welcome so, back, everyone. This is part two of the Dusk meeting. Had a little bit of a mishap, but finally made it to part two. We're going to do some tech questions now. I know the first part mm -hmm. was a little bit of tech, but now we're going to get into the real meat of the stuff. And I brought Mark here. So, Mark, say hello. Introduce yourself. Hello, Mark. Uh, I seem to be becoming the resident tech head, also known <laughs> as the Negus, Greedy Ferengi. Yeah. Like to ask some questions about Dusk. And there it is. And we also have Fulvio, Fulvio Venturelli, who is, yeah, I believe, I the CTO. I'm not sure. Uh, well, we don't have this kind of uh, branding in Dusk, uh, um, but yeah, let's say I'm one of the founders and uh, I take care of infrastructure, technology, uh, all this sort of stuff. Okay, great. So hopefully we can get some amazing answers then. All right. So Mark, I know you have all of the questions set up, so I will let you go ahead and take the stage. Yeah, I'm going to focus mainly on the virtual machine um, because... It changed a lot of the other things change so quickly. I don't really want to dig into too much detail on that rather than something that's actually going to really ramp up the adoption and the scale of dusk, I think, is the primary focus for us here. Um, 
Projected time scale for full implementation of the VM. Are we looking at Q4? Yes, hopefully. Well, as you as you might know, our our project is quite on the on the very bleeding edge and at the forefront mm -hmm. of a lot of different research. So what we are doing is we are shooting for Q4. We are fairly confident that the you know all the different Gordian knots have been already um, you know unbound. Um, untied, sorry, but um, but you never know. You know we are we are actually uh, implementing a zero knowledge virtual machine, so a virtual machine that basically leaves the input, so the transactions, that normally are the input of the distributed and decentralized process, um, private, and that alone is quite uh, it's quite a research undertaking so uh, although we are confident that q4 is uh, is definitely our our target target uh, time for for release then uh, there might be some uh, you know some hurdles along the way but so far so good that's normal i mean you know over a decade pm myself i know there's always a bit of slippage you put your contingencies yeah. in and you have to manage it as it happens and just stay as close as you can um, as long as you're focused on it, you should be fine. Oh, um, we're very focused. <laughs> let's, let's, exactly. Let's, let's not, let's mean, not yeah. forget that this is crypto and uh, delays are just, you know, pretty common. So <laughs> well, I, I don't want I, I don't want you to take these as a, a you know preemptive <laughs> excuse for anybody. Right. That there is there is no delay that that we are that we are. Now, let's say so far the stars look aligned. So <laughs> good. So a lot of the delays in Kim crypto they can be but i think a lot of that actually is if you look at teams you notice that very very few projects implement really rigorous project management at the senior management level very few i've only seen four or five a lot of the rest of them seem to be okay we've got a bunch of devs doing extreme programming and a bit of agile mm -hmm. but there's no real structure to it you know and nobody's tracking what, what with it that slip I can tell you a little bit about, I mean, uh, about you have that, yeah. So you yeah. should be okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So our our uh, development process has been uh, um, well. It's, it's one of my strong suits. I've been I've been doing that for for twenty years. Mm. I've been doing that at uh, actually major corporation and Fulvio, uh, Fulvio as well. So, um, but right now what we are what we are uh, implementing here at Dusk is uh, a development process which is um, which we sort of uh, which sort of got inspired by the development process at Mozilla we have different pods we call them pods of two three different people that are concentrated and focus on one precise uh, item so yeah. we have pod for example for the virtual machine we have got another pod for the consensus another pod for the research another pod for uh, uh, zero calf and all these pods basically have got very very uh, i wouldn't say strict deadlines because everything is quite uh, managed in an agile way but we have um we we put extra efforts in coordinating all those yeah. pods and in planning everything accordingly so everybody knows what everybody else is doing mm -hmm. uh, however we have clear responsibilities and we can pinpoint inefficiencies in the development process pretty quickly yeah that's the way to do it um modular teams overlaps crossovers take care of the dependencies and the stories iterations as long as you keep eye on it you should be good um yeah not many teams do that they do it on the fly <laughs> and then they're like oh my god we're late yeah I've, and it's nice to see people actually doing it properly because it even though you know it causes friction sometimes when you're missing a deadline it's worth it because you get it done exactly another, another cool thing is that basically although we have a uh, um people working remotely we noticed that they love coming here and staying in the office with us so sometimes they just say okay can i come next week to stay with you guys and we have people coming from uh, kiev uh, uh, Portugal, you know, uh, mm. uh, so there is a constant Spain, UK. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, they love being, you know, part of the part of the team uh, from a, from a physical point of view. Let's say that's good. You've got to have that as well. Yeah, it's always a better to have a bit of face to face with an team. Yeah. Um, what was the next one? Yeah, uh, VMQ four. But obviously, if people are going to build on it. Tool sets and plugins. Presumably, that's staggered 
for people to build on the VM. <coughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to do it at the same time because that creates even more workload on the teams. Mm -hmm. Well, we we love to do to do things uh, on uh, on a priority order, right? Uh, yeah. But without really losing focus on the on the bigger picture. Ultimately, the VM uh, we want the VM to be to be used broadly, not only by um, you know developers that are active or propositions that are active in the security or the regulated financial market space or reg tech, as uh, some some call it. We want broader ad adoption. However, this is uh, an end goal, and we shouldn't rush it, which is the reason why, uh, initially, we are going to um, you know, focus on the securities uh, space. And therefore, we are going to work together with all the different propositions uh, that, uh, right now, we are collaborating with in order to deploy the uh, XSC smart contracts that are going to be the first mm. decentralized applications on the uh, on the zero knowledge virtual virtual machine, uh, tooling is obviously a big one, and uh, we want to get it right. And therefore, uh, there is already some uh, plan uh, for uh, you know rolling out tools that will uh, you know make our development team obsolete, which ultimately is what we want. You know, we want everybody to be able to uh, contribute and to build on top of the of the VM. Um, and it is going to it is going to happen, but probably it's not going to happen uh, in Q4. <laughs> yeah, I've got a point about that. You'll probably find as you roll out the tool set that um, the priorities in terms of the bespoke needs of all the people who want to build on it, because they are going to be building their own bespoke applications within the account based system that you've got. That's right. Yeah. Um, the priorities will probably change depending on what they produce first. Don't you think? In terms of segments and teams and requirements. So my point is, you can you can say, okay, we're going to rule out tooling sets X, Y, and Z. But you might find as they actually come on live, the priority stream would change to X, Y, Z, and A, for example, in terms of you know what you're actually building. Because what I'm saying is it's an iterative process. You learn as you do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For sure. That's for sure. Which um, is actually the best way to do it, I think. Yeah. I, I, I can say that initially what we are going to roll out is going to be a, a template, sort of a one size catch most. Almost <laughs> everything. <laughs> or almost and then you'll get more granularity as they actually do it. Ab absolutely. So yeah. um, it is definitely in our uh, in our intention to roll out, um, you know, something like the equivalent of solidity for, for our own VM uh, in order to provide, you know, the level of flexibility that any kind of DAP developer needs. Uh, but this is coming after we, we tweak uh, the the yes. React perfection. So initially, yeah. we are going to deploy directly uh, bytecodes <laughs> on the on the virtual machine without having a, a transpilation layer uh, like an intermediate an intermediate language. Uh, we will use we will definitely use a user friendly template that any kind of um, you know financial actor can can use quite easily. Also regulators, also auditors, also issuers, but. Um, but then for the language, we will definitely need to, um, you know, build on top of that. Yeah. So I was thinking um, in terms of the pipeline of partnerships, you can split it probably into the initial focus of securities. And then everybody else would come under tokenized assets, wouldn't they, in the short term? Yeah. You can say so, yes. There, yeah. With some exception. Because one thing that is very important uh, it, within the the, finan the regulated financial space, for example, is voting. Compliance. Yeah. Compliance, voting, uh, all these things, they are uh, peripheric to, um, <coughs> to the security space. But at the same time, they are, uh, they are core components, as a matter of fact. And uh, together with that, also the capability of deploying or to have, to have a deployment uh, that take all, all the different uh, kind of regulatory frameworks 
I'll, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a very specific example, right? So one that most probably Fulvio can uh, can elaborate on better than I could. Uh, to give you an example, even having servers or having nodes uh, that are run, uh, obviously we don't have controls of, of, of all the nodes. You know, it's uh, it is a, a permissionless it is a permissionless uh, network. However, uh, somehow because of some regulatory framework, then we need to ensure that at least the nodes that we run, they do not run, for example, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, because we we exclude uh, sadly, <laughs> but uh, we 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 need to exclude uh, people coming from certain jurisdictions, um, and we do not even want to have infrastructures there. So uh, you know it's it's not only about uh, it's not only about the VM is about uh, the VM is about the uh, the deployment system that we are using. It is about the tooling that we want to do the templates and. Uh, all the rest of different other uh, applications that are built around it. It's, uh, it was quite an undertaking, but we are well on our way to deliver uh, according to our roadmap. So I'm yeah. pretty happy. It's awesome. interesting that you've got a geo filter on the actual encrypted IPs when they have things. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, when I, you're something but... Ethereum, you basically have no rules, so everything can run yeah. anywhere. But uh, yeah, uh, in our case, it's a bit different. So we have to take care of that of all the legal and uh, you know. Um, is it is it possible uh, for you guys to go back and change that at all in the future if regulations change? Let's say. Uh, yeah, theoretically, yeah, of okay. course, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, right now, you know, it's complicated. So you have yeah. to make sure that that is around. So you just in a, keep an eye on it and then have an exception if it changes, really, I would have thought. Yeah. 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 There's two things that make it bespoke, I thought, is one is the actual client need. Second is the regulatory compliance requirements for each geographic area. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a it's kind of a two stage filter in terms of what they can do on decks before they can even uh, on dust before they can even start building as it were which makes each one within each account very bespoke depending on what they build um i very much like the fact that it's going with zero knowledge <laughs> we you only have to proof yeah it's <laughs> okay yeah Yes, yes. Actually, zero knowledge, zero, knowledge, zero knowledge cryptography is uh, is amazing. You know, I, I mean, if if we if we are talking about, uh, I, I was speaking with somebody the other day uh, about uh, technology and uh, sorcery, right? Magic, and uh, th this this guy had a very a very interesting definition. He said that uh, technology is magic explained. When you, when when you cannot really explain something, then it's magic. When it when it is explained in terms that can be understood, then it becomes, becomes then it becomes technology. A quote about that I can't remember. Well, um, it was Arthur C. Clarke. Yeah, magic is indistinguishable from technology, and that people perceive it as magic if they don't understand it. Yeah. For example, uh, a television. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if yeah. you, uh, I'll give you a very, a very stupid example. If you, if you are seeing somebody levitating <laughs> on on a roof, <laughs> then it's uh, it's it's magic. I, I mean, it's not by chance that that copper. I for think example, I think the quote was something like, uh, "Any sufficiently advanced technology cannot be distinguished from magic." From magic. That's yeah. the one. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we yeah, read yeah. here on the Your Next Gen podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, like I said, this, this this wasn't my quote. I mean, somebody, somebody. Mm. Some no, it's true. That's true for sure. And uh, but why am I saying that? I'm I'm saying that because zero knowledge the cryptography. When when actually I I, I uh, start to study it, when I started to get in touch with it and uh, uh, and understood the possibility, it was nothing short of witchery mm -hmm. <laughs> for me. I mean, mm -hmm. the capability of proving. A statement um, in a uh, beyond any 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 doubt, without knowing anything or without leaking any information about that statement, is it was it was awesome. You know, it was something that that really that really left me in complete awe, and uh, um, and I immediately understood uh, you know the possibilities, the opportunities, and. The, the use cases that such that such a, a marvelous advancement in cryptography could 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 open up for us, 
whenever we are talking about zero knowledge cryptography, people always think about in terms of anonymity and privacy, but there is one thing that, that uh, is uh, constantly overlooked, which is performance. You know, if I can process something and I can uh, propagate the uh, result of this processing and everybody can trust that that is the outcome, that means that I need to process that thing only once. Yeah. And this means basically that, you know, you get a, a powerful enough yeah. um, computer uh, supercomputer, if you want, and have a lot of very heavy calculations there, and propagate propagate the zero knowledge proof that those calculations are correct. Nobody else need to calculate that. Just verify. They just need to verify it, which yeah. normally is a very uh, you know a much more lightweight operation yeah. than doing the processing itself. Yeah. And that is that itself is the key to scalability. Mm -hmm. It's not by chance that Ethereum is actually. Uh, researching more and more the capability of uh, introducing uh, snarks mm. and uh, and supporting it. I mean, snarks have got the problem of being uh, of being relying on a trust setup, but that's that's a different problem. Uh, it is the key to performance. It is the key to regulatory to reg regulatory compliance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've been I've been hearing people saying nonsense like, well, you know, anonymity cannot be or privacy is not compliant. Well, that's that's bull crap. If yeah. <laughs> privacy it depends where you are. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. What you want is not openness or or uh, you know just uh, broadcasting to the open network who you are, what your identity is, or this kind of stuff. You want to broadcast a proof that you can transact or that you are allowed to perform certain operation. People or systems shouldn't actually care who you are. They should care only about what you what can do. Yeah, exactly. It's the reason yeah. why identity management systems, they are the wrong solution to a very, very painful problem. And our solution to that is Zero knowledge cryptography. Okay, well, you yeah. just may be really, really bullish. So I'm going to go buy some <laughs> more dust tokens. <laughs> There's also the thing that, you know, you're doing the initial focus is security token issuance. People in that space and people buying, say, rare art, for example, that will be tokenized or um, debt that's tokenized in the future. The institutional investors now in the fiat space, the, you know, the governments can bleat on all they want about, oh, if you're transacting with privacy, you must be doing something wrong. All those institutional investors are doing it with a certain level of discretion assured. Oh, yeah. Yeah? Absolutely. In terms of their privacy. Now, if they're going to come to, a, um, to do it digitally, they're not going to give that up just for the sake of technology. That has to be provided, and then some as well in terms of privacy. You know, because you have to actually provide more discretion to them in a way to attract them to the platform. Absolutely. Without taking away anything they've this already got. These particular propositions, they do already exist, you know, oh, yeah. uh, in, in, in a centralized way. I mean, everything that is uh, of a substantial size is traded on a dark pool. Dark hmm. pool of liquidity is used by everyone that trade blocks of shares of securities of debt or whatever in chunks of 50 million dollars plus and the reason for that is that all these different institutions they want to keep their strategy private so what they do they go to uh, uh they go to trade on dark pools of liquidity and unfortunately considering that they that these things are centralized and they do not really use a trustless technology, then there is always a broker that is the yeah. entry point to this dark pool of liquidity, which by itself is uh, the source of potentially the source of any leakage. It's up to him, um, which opens up the door for a lot of different other consideration like insider trading and these other things, but um, I digress. So these things are already there it's uh, they they are read aloud in a very inefficient way in a very costly way what we are doing 
is just democratizing access to the same tool, providing more security to it, and uh, effectively solving a problem that has been has been there for ages because it's yeah, been about decades, hundreds of years. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, hundreds. Of years. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we are we are here in the Netherlands where the where shares were invented. You know, it's uh, we're talking about the 18th century. So oh, we eliminate the middleman of all. I mean, and like, uh, we want to eliminate the last point of inefficiency, which is the middleman. Yeah, it's the point of inefficiency, the additional cost load, and each one of these points of inefficiency security wise is potentially a single point of failure which Absolutely. is something you should never ever have because if you break that point of failure you break everything yeah. within any system regardless of what it's on you know so this this is good to see as well yeah i'm happy all those tech questions excellent thank you very much yeah our pleasure pleasure there it is boys and girls dusk network uh Needless to say, I do own some Dust Network tokens. I am invested personally. Disclaimer for anyone watching this. Um, I think Dust Network is great. I think what they're doing is pretty cutting edge. You guys have heard it yourself. I mean, this the team is super strong. What they're building is, is really intriguing and interesting. And it's it's very unique as well, which is hard to come by when, when you look at blockchain projects. And yes, it Dusk, is. Dusk yeah. is, is, I would say, perhaps even a little bit more than just a simple blockchain project. Looks like they're actually doing some some things even outside of that with respects to compliance and regulation and all of that. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's awesome. I hope to hear more from you guys. Uh, so, Emanuela, do you have anything that you want to say to anyone listening? Do you want to give your Twitter handle? I already have I have a little graphic at the bottom, but if you want for anyone who's listening to give your Twitter handle or how they can reach you. Sure, sure. Just uh, reach me out on, on, on Twitter or on Telegram even. I'm, I'm actually very, very active on both. And uh, I'm always very happy to, to answer any question. Cool. And Fulvio, do you have a Twitter or Telegram? You have a Telegram, yeah? yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. Just contact me and uh, yeah, I'm happy to... Okay. Well, I'll include those in the video description at the bottom. Anyone can uh, cool. go ahead and talk science and, and math and crypto to you guys. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that was it. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, yeah, that's it.